So let's begin by talking about developing a narrative. Um, we're going to look at the player experience and a little bit of the concept of aesthetics of play. So um, these are some of the subheadings that you can start with. Some of our lectures from now on will be structured this way where I give you a summary of what we're going to be talking about via what you'll put in your GDD. So in this lecture we'll talk about um, what your narrative summary will be, how to describe your player experience, how to describe your story structure and your plot outline, and how to talk about the relationship of your narrative to game mechanics. So starting with your summary, this is one to three sentences summarizing your story premise. Condense your summary down to the biggest hook that sets the scene. This is also called framing or the premise. So even if your game doesn't have a story, and I know that some of you might be uh, developing something that doesn't have a lot of narrative backing to it, it almost always still has framing. Um, so as an example, Candy Crush Saga uh, is a match three game that is its genre would be a match three um and most of the time you're inside the the game board for that and um and you're you know like matching colors together and getting points and that's most of the gameplay experience but there is still a narrative framing there and the narrative framing is that you are uh, a girl who is I think visiting like a candy fantasy land and you meet different characters along the way all of the the match three puzzles are framed as candy obviously that's where the candy crush comes from and so even though there's not like explicitly a story to that game or at least not very often um, there is still a premise so this might be pretty similar to or it might be even a restatement of your theme and that's okay it may also end up becoming a component of your pitch um, so this is just a very short, like one sentence usually, maybe it's a couple in the end. So as an example, in Super Mario World, you could um, frame the summary as a simple plumber named Mario goes on an adventure to save Princess Toadstool and the world from Bowser and his minions. In the example of Shadow of the Colossus, our summary is, in order to revive a young girl, a boy named Wander travels across the world to defeat Colossi with his horse as his only companion. And the summary of Okami might be, after a hundred years of slumber, the sun goddess is reincarnated as an ink-wielding wolf in order to restore life to a land gripped by evil demons. And you can see that in these summaries we normally try to name the player character, if there is one. Um, we normally try to uh, describe an action or something that might hint at a game mechanic since as you'll see your narrative and your game mechanics often go hand in hand so here we say ink wielding wolf in shadow of the colossus it's it's um emphasize that it's a it's a lonely journey like he has only one companion and it's a horse uh in mario it's about saving the princess right so that's an example of summary so moving on to the player experience, what ha when X happens, the player should feel Y. This is um, a framing sentence that you can use. So what kinds of emotions should the player feel while playing? Do emotional reactions change at certain points in the game or in the core loop? Here, the goal isn't really to say the player is going to have fun. Um, that's a lot too vague for what we're describing in this, um, in this instance. What I want is a sort of a summary of the core emotions um, that your player will feel at different parts in the game and if needed you can break this player experience down into like different segments of the plot if they're supposed to feel different things at different times. Uh, so some examples of emotions could be excited, relaxed, elated, depressed, afraid, powerful. These are all um, much more specific than simply like fun or in flow state or something like that. So it's not always about fun. This is a vague word that doesn't actually get into the depths of experiences that players or even people have, right? This is, if you were telling this as a story, what feelings do you want someone to have? Um, and again, you can use that phrase directly in your GDD if you like. When X happens, the player should feel Y. So like going back to Okami, um, when Okami revives an area, the player should feel joy and relief and a sense of wonder, for example. 
So think about your genre. How do games like yours usually make players feel? How do players, you can even look, if you want to do this research, look at um, reviews of games in the same genre as yours. How do players describe their own experiences? That could give you a hint about how you think that the experience should feel overall. Will your game replicate that experience or is it gonna subvert expectations? Um, if you're not familiar with the concept of subversion, this is the idea of going against expectations or creating the opposite feeling. So this also means going against the norm. Um, so in politics, for example, the punk movement was subversive to societal norms, which is part of what made it provocative or alluring to its fans. So you could choose to subvert your genre by giving players a different experience than the one that you're, they're used to, or you could sort of uphold the genre by giving players the experience that is, is similar to other games. And again, think about your game pillars. How do they relate to creating the feelings that you want? So we can look at a, a framework for this. So mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics, or MDA, is a framework for player experience um, that was, it's, it's used in academic contexts, and it's based on a white paper um, that was written uh, probably about 15 years ago. I'm not sure exactly when. Um, so this is split up, mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics as a way of like categorizing and describing games is split up into these three categories. So mechanics covers rules, math, statistics, physics, all the stuff that we covered in the kind of previous two lectures, right? Dynamics covers actions a player takes, so running, battling, strategizing. We've covered a little bit of that in our pillars. And then aesthetics, which is what we'll focus on today, it doesn't in this case actually um, refer to like the visuals or the art. What they mean is more of the fundamental reasons a player chooses one game or another. So this is the reasons for playing, what makes a game interesting or fun. Uh, and yeah, again, today we'll cover the aesthetics portion. So even if a particular game touches on all of the aesthetics that we're about to mention, most games benefit from focusing on just a few and attracting the type of players who resonate with those kinds of experiences. So usually the following aesthetics are also tied up in genre expectations, like uh, I was just saying before. So these are the aesthetics, the eight aesthetics of play. Um, for your game, if you want to frame your GDD in this way, I would say to choose perhaps two or three, or even one if your game is small enough. And the aesthetics are sensation, fantasy, narrative, challenge, fellowship, discovery, expression, and submission. All right, so sensation is game as sensory pleasure. These are experiences which are pleasurable to the physical senses, usually visual and auditory, uh, but new technologies may provide other opportunities for touch, kinesthetics, smell even, um, as we start to move into virtual reality, augmented reality, and um, those sorts of technologies. So game as sensory pleasure. One of the games that comes to mind for me might be Journey or Okami. Um, I'm trying to think back on what I've played recently. Um, yeah, so those tend to be about like the the sort of pleasurable beauty of what partially what you're seeing on screen and just like like the feelings that it's creating for you. So pleasurable to the physical senses. Fantasy games is make believe. So experiences which allow the player to become or experience something that they can't in real life, such as a soldier, adventurer, or a cat cafe owner. <laughs> if any of you are playing Calico these days, um, so yeah, these tend to be like the the play pretend kind of games. And I do include. There are like you know, it doesn't just have to be fantasy as like like high fantasy. This includes the fantasy of doing any kind of thing. Um, so that could include something like Call of Duty where you're like put in a particular situation and you're expected to like fulfill the role of being like part of a you know a military project or whatever for example. That's a power fantasy. That's still an example of fantasy for a lot of people. Um, a sports game uh, where you're either playing you know as a powerful athlete or you're planning um, like a team over a season, that's a, a really powerful fantasy for a lot of people. Narrative, so game is drama. This is experiences which support intriguing and engaging narrative. So this includes experiences with an explicit story, as well as those where drama is created through player actions or player interactions. Um, so, you know, 
classic JRPGs, maybe like if any of you have played Final Fantasy VII Remake this year, this one was pretty heavy on narrative. I would say a lot of those open world games, um, like Skyrim and Breath of the Wild, are and and you know like Red Dead Redemption Two, for example, are quite focused on the narrative, even though it's sprawling and can be completed in you know a lot of different orders and maybe includes at sometimes a multiplayer component. This is still like creating a dramatic experience of some kind. Challenge. So game is obstacle course. These are experiences which are about overcoming obstacles. So that could be the environment, it could be other players, it could be oneself. Uh, this is not necessarily the same as creating difficulty, but this aesthetic can also include the concept of competition. So, I mean, I think a lot of people would consider the Dark Souls games as being um, this game is obstacle course to some degree, but it can be simpler than that. It can be, you know, like a racing game, for example, or, I mean, there are games that are more directly, ob like, clearly obstacle courses as well, but um, if it's about the environment, uh, maybe even something like Death Stranding could fall into that kind of category, right? Game says fellowship. So this is a game as a social framework. These are experiences which engender cooperation, teamwork, being social or being among friends. Um, Animal Crossing might be a really good example of that from, from the past year. Even though you're doing a lot of stuff solo, I think a lot of their gameplay was built with the idea that you would be showing things to friends or inviting friends to your island. Um, you have their AI, but you have friends on the island, and I think, generally speaking, that's kind of like you you experience that in the same way as a real person to some degree. Um, cooperative games could include like I mean, there's lots of uh, co-op stuff out there. Maybe Overcooked, something like that. Among Us, even though it's competitive in Among Us, the point of the game is to hang out with your friends. Discovery, so this is game is uncharted territory. Experiences which are about finding or learning new things, such as places, information, abilities, or strategies. Um, again, I think that Dark Souls kind of falls in this category, uh, but for a different kind of player. <laughs> I think there's a player that's really into like the PvP and the bosses and the hardness of it, and there's players about like, I want to figure out my own way through, I want to, you know, learn the geography of this region, I want to learn how the stats work and what I can build that's like powerful for me. Um, yeah, I think the the charm combinations in Hollow Knight, for example, are a good uh, example of like discovery in strategy, um, finding a way through that is sort of the best fit for you. But it can also be more direct. It can be like I simply like opening new maps and seeing new things and meeting new people. Um, MMOs are pretty good at this too. And expression game is self discovery. These are experiences which support expressing individuality, such as through customization, fashion, creation, or building. Um, so I would say Animal Crossing <laughs> is really good at this. Stardew Valley is pretty good at this. Um, you know, if you're into FF14, the glamour system allows a lot of this, and people do joke about, like, you know, that fashion is the real end game, or <laughs> joke about fashion souls and like building costumes and that sort of thing. Um, but it's other kind of customization as well. It's just any way that you're sort of like, you know, again, discovering what fits for you and also being able to express your identity through, through a character or through a world. And then submission. Um, game is pastime. These are experiences which allow a player to zone out or lose themselves in play. I think a lot of mobile games um, fall into this territory where it's just something you do because it makes the numbers go up and you like getting the scores. Uh, I, I think tet Tetris is a bit like this. Game is pastime. Yeah. So if you choose two or three aesthetics, you can help clarify your player experience as well as your pillars and theme. So um, yeah, think about these aesthetics. Think about how they reflect the games that you've played or, or you know, pick out a couple of games that you've played recently and try to determine what you think it's, it's like best aesthetics are or the ones that you've been 
um, most paying attention to while playing that game. And again, go back and look at other games in the same genre as the game is that, uh, that you're making and see if you can pick out the aesthetics for those games as well, because maybe that will give you some more information as to how you should build yours.